Hello, my name is Markus Wanninger and I'm the product manager at Waters. In today's session, I would like to give you some understanding of how the consideration of consumables for the HPLC QC workflow fit in your method lifecycle management strategy. Although this is not a seminar about MLCM per se, I'd like to start off with a brief introduction of the concept of method lifecycle management to get us all on the same page and set the stage appropriately. So in part one, I want to have a brief look at variations in an analytical HPLC method and ways to control the risk within that method. In part two, then, I'd like to discuss how the theories of the MLCM framework play a role when deciding on the selection of the appropriate consumables and the right tools for a method. This will cover the general sample flow for HPLC, the considerations in the early days of method development and strategies on how to demonstrate method robustness in later stages of the cycle. As mentioned, I'd like to start with bringing us all on the same page and have a look at sources of variation, risk, and, brief, and the brief introduction to MLCM. So when you sit back for a second and think about what good means for you, what does this non-quantifiable term mean for you? And I think you will find that it means different things for different people. However, I think generally speaking, you can say that you want good detection of impurities, you want good intermediate results, you want successful method transfers, you want to be able to easy pinpoint cause of method failures, and of course, you don't want to have any out of specifications or out of trend results. Last but not least, your method should be cost effective. By no means is this listing complete, and all encompassing, but it's just an idea of what most people think of a good method. There are several factors on how to achieve that. Uh, three of them are listed here. They are consistent sample handling, they are consistent chemistry column performance, and they are consistent instrument performance. Before the discussion of life cycle management of analytical methods, scientists such as yourself have carried out on what is called the traditional approach to method management. Traditional method management treats the stages of method development, validation, transfer, and routine usage as separate entities with a limited understanding of how and why the method can change from development to routine use. Even though regulatory guidelines are considered during each step, especially during method validation and transfer, the procedures of moving the method methods to the next stage is a very checkbox-like approach. So once the method has passed the required written specifications, the method is considered suitable to move on. Limited understanding or control of sources of variability means there is no understanding of how changes on method performance can be compromised or even improved or how performance can be maintained and be consistent throughout the method lifecycle. You also have to consider that each of these steps is executed by individuals which have very different goals in mind. So therefore we can conclude, and the world has concluded, that the standard old-fashioned checkbox approach for method development is maybe not the most suitable approach anymore. Life is a bell curve. And so with any process that we are involved with in our daily professional life. Variation occurs in the manufacturing process as well as in the analytical process. Variation is normal. It is, however, most important to understand the sources of variation and to gain control of the variation and the factors which impact the variability. For example, if the intermediate test results vary from analyst to analyst, then the method transfer between different locations in between labs or countries or different divisions within a corporation will be a lengthy and therefore costly process. The consistency of an LC separation will depend on the quality of the sample preparation. This can lead to inconsistent, noisy trends and worst case, dirty samples which can degrade column performance. 
The detection of the target, target analyte may be suppressed due to matrix effects, which leads to inconsistent results reporting. All of the above can cause out-of-spec or out-of-trend reports, leading to an analysis, rerun, and lengthy and costly data review process. This adds time and cost to the sample analysis. MLCM, or Method Lifecycle Management, also called APLM, which is Analytical Procedure Lifecycle Management, provides a framework helping you to assess the risks in a method throughout the three stages in its lifecycle. It also helps you to implement control strategies for each stage, which are all part of an AQVD, which is analytical quality by design approach. So MLCM is an approach to method management, understanding, managing, and subsequently controlling the factors of variations and the resulting risk, all of which ensure that methods are fit for purpose throughout their lifetime and in every stage. Here are specific benefits to methods when controlling different sources of variability. The biggest goal is always to control and to reduce risk. And that can be achieved by, for example, simplified method transfer, increased traceability and compliance for method investigations. When you reduce the risk, that promotes reliable, consistent results. So therefore, that reduces the out-of-spec and out-of-trend and um, complaints and results. And uh, clear method procedures are the fundamental of every method, and that helps you to control and minimize the risk. In the end of the day, controlling and reducing risks does lower the cost by fear, having fewer downtimes of the instrumentation and uh, increased lifetime of the consumer, as simple as that. So that much about the theory. But what does all this mean for you and your everyday life in the lab, planning and developing and executing methods? In the second part, in the next part of this presentation, I want to touch on how you can connect the dots between the needs of risk uh, reduction in the MLCM framework and practical thoughts about how to choose the appropriate consumer, how you choose the tool that is best suited for the job you have to do. Let's have a look at the simplified schematic of the journey of a sample throughout the uh, LC workflow in the analytical QC lab. So you start with your sample, which could be a finished product or raw material in the uh, production process. You will have to go through some sort of sample preparation or sample extraction, analyte extraction process, which will differ greatly, of course. Eventually, the sample will reach a sample storage or sample container, which will hold the sample and uh, will enable it to be transferred to the um, LC stack to perform the separation. The separation creates data, which then eventually produces the result. So when you look in a little bit more detail at the individual steps I showed in the previous slides, it's easy to see and easy to understand that each of these steps contains a variety of sources for variation. That starts with the analyte extraction or the analyte isolation. You have to consider the stability of the analyte um, between the time when it is extracted and it sits on the lab bench and it's transferred to the auto sampler and sits on the in the auto sampler until it is being injected. So the time is a big factor. Is it light sensitive? What temperature uh, fluctuations does it go through? And there is a lot of materials that you use involved, um, starting with something, with something as simple as the filter you use, the biotype, the solvents for your mobile phases, the um, HPLC column. All these different factors and more, which are not listed in this diagram, lead to a certain level of method robustness and all these factors you would have to consider when you start to develop a method or when you run a method. So for the purpose of the seminar, I suggest to start the decision process at the end of the analysis. The choice of LC separation, whether it's HPLC or UPLC or anything in between and the detection mode will drive many upstream decisions, such as sample preparation needs, bio choice and so forth and so forth. 
in order to make the decision between HPLC and UPLC, there's really two deciding factors here, as I see them. One is the demand of the ATP. What level of separation and what level of detection do you need in your final QC workflow? And of course, it is a business decision. How much uh, cost are you built and able to pay per sample you analyze? Are there time constraints? What instrument, instrumentation is available upstream and downstream in the method development process? You should consider what the laboratory's demands are, right? A routine QC analysis lab has different demands than a method development lab. All this really leads to the selection, selection of the uh, correct consumable. You have to match, for example, your column configuration and the particle size to match the LC to avoid subpar performance. And uh, you want to choose the right vial type, which really matches the need of your uh, anal analytical method. As for the column in the stationary phase, you have to understand the attributes of the column chemistry, meaning you have to understand the attributes of the base particle. What type of retention does it have? What type of analyte does it work best with? The selectivity, the peak shape it produces, the efficiency, and of course, this uh, goes hand in hand with the um, understanding the attributes of the bonded phase, what retention you achieve with what bonded phase, again, what selectivity and what peak shape your analysis needs to, uh, needs to provide by the end of the day. So as there are many factors which are all interconnected, it simplifies the decision making if you can choose a stationary phase, which is available for each separation mode. To put it in simple words, if you have to say, I can't choose the stationary phase, which would do the best job, but it's not only it's not available in this and that particle size, it's only available in that particle size, which I cannot use in my QC lab, that is not a good statement. If you can choose from a palette of modern stationary phases, base particles and bonded chemistries, which are fully scalable, meaning they are available from HPLC and larger particle sizes, four, three and a half micron and so forth, to UHPLC, which is in the two micron range, down to UPLC, the sub two micron particle sizes for high end performance. That is a great choice to have, and it gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility. The cost choice can be daunting at times, or you want to switch from one column to another, we at Waters have some good tools to guide you through this process. Our column coach, for example, will help you to scale a method to switch stationary phases, find L-level column equivalents, and uh, help you with many more aspects. The link to the coach is given on the slide, and a Google search of uh, Waters column coach will lead you there as well. I mentioned earlier that the need of selecting the right stationary phase to suit your ATP demands and your LC system requirements can be daunting. So Waters has a full method development seminar at hand to teach you all about the tools and strategies to help you achieving your goal. Reach out to your local sales representative to learn more about this uh, method development seminar. So I wonder, did this ever happen to you? Every time you get a new column, your chromatography changes, and you wonder why. You have to understand that variation is normal, but should be controlled, because only uncontrolled variation is the enemy of quality. So variation in column performance needs to be accounted for. So you should have a vendor with high quality columns and a low level of lot to lot variability. If you are interested in the performance in that respect of Waters columns, I highly recommend you to look um, for the application note, which was released very recently in January of 2020. This application note, the literature number is noted here on the slide, looks at the variation of a number of batches and packing materials over the course of many years of availability. And only a supplier with a high quality standard and well understood variation in the manufacturing process can provide such a level of reproducibility. However, 
Despite the supplier and vendor quality, of course, you are still obligated to demonstrate lot-to-lot -lot variability and thus method robustness. To simplify this process, you can choose MVKs, method validation kits. These column kits contain three columns packed with three different lots of separation media to help you in an easy and convenient way to generate the data necessary for your validation and documentation process. To avoid unexpected results, as I mentioned them in a humorous way a couple of slides ago, you will ask yourself always two questions. First question you will ask yourself is whether it is the scientists or the method developers fault. Was the method not reproducible or robust? Was it poorly written? Is it an operator error? And so forth and so forth. To get answers to those questions, you will use the MLCM, fra MLCM framework that will help you to control the risk in all the stages of the method lifecycle. The second questions you will ask yourself, whether it is the manufacturer's or supplier's fault, where are the tools faulty? Is the variability in the tools too great for my method? So you don't have to keep asking yourself that questions if you work with a supplier with a high level of commitment to a product quality. This moves us from the selection of the LC stack and the detection method one step further down to the sample storage. So let's talk about sample storage and sample vials for one second. As most samples spend an extended period of time in the sample vial, it is valuable to spend a few minutes going over the attributes and explaining why and where the differences in sample vials exist. So it is important to note here that all sample vials for HPLC, or most sample vials for HPLC anyway, are made from USP type 1 glass. However, you should know that USP type 1 glass is the uh, behavior of the glass is loosely defined. And not all glass is created equal for a variety of reasons, which I don't want to get into. But saying that all USP type 1 glass sample vials behave the same is like saying that all L1 level designated columns will deliver the same result of separation. And you know that is not a true fact. Another point to consider is that vials are often purchased and distributed locally by the different vendors. Meaning, if you buy a glass vial in the Americas from vendor A, there will be a very different glass vial when, than when you buy the same brand in Asia. This will lead to local variations and variability in glass vials. That needs to be avoided. You would ideally want to have the same glass from the same source, no matter where you deploy your method. You have to consider, as you very well know, the composition of the scepter. The cleanliness of the scepter is critical, and a lot of impurities actually come from the silicone in the scepter. Um, there Again, there's technical reasons for that, in which I don't want to get into in detail in this presentation. Another point you have to think about that glass is actually an active surface that interacts or can interact with your sample. You can start with hydrophobic interactions, such as non-specific adsorptions or non-specific binding, depending on your molecule type. And with the um, glass composition, that can cause uh, create a pH change. Alkali metals are leaching from the glass into your sample and uh, change your pH. Large and small molecules interact very differently with your glass. So these are some considerations you should uh, you should think about. And of course, there is the different level of cleanliness. You don't need to have the best and most expensive glass for every one single ones of your analysis. Um, therefore, there are different stages of cleanliness available. So we provide you a variety of levels of vial performance, so you can choose the right vial um, for your analysis demand. We are starting at the bottom with the um, standard water vials, which are really made for legacy methods and low demanding methods. We're moving up the ladder to LCGC certified vials 
which are vials for basic LCV applications typically done today, small molecule QC laboratories, and like concentrations, PPM microgram per mill level. If your analysis becomes more demanding, you would switch to LCMS certified vials made for single quad routine MS analysis. If you are working on the higher end analysis, you can view, uh, move to TrueView vials, TrueView LCMS certified vials made for uh, triple quads, and they display a lower level of absorption of uh, small polar analytes. And uh, the range of corn recovery vials is really designed for, uh, for the biopharmaceutical market when you work with peptides and when you work with smaller proteins. They greatly reduce the levels of non-specific binding typically absorbed in uh, glass vials or plastic vials. If you want to learn more about vials, we do have a short vial seminar. Um, it talks in more detail about the importance of vial dimensions and vial and septa cleanliness. We're talking about different uh, behavior of vial glass surfaces and uh, show you some case studies in the seminar of what could potentially happen or what you have to consider when choosing a sample vial. Now, after we have a lot of the fundamentals set straight and made some good choices, we are finally reaching the beginning of the journey of the sample, the sample itself and the sample preparation or analyte extraction. So there are a few considerations which I want to really, really briefly touch on about your sample and your sample matrix. So you have to understand your sample matrix and you have to understand the uh, requirements to extract your analytes of interest from either biological matrix or matrix of a uh, of a small molecule analyte. You have to think about the desired concentration of your LC analysis and the sensitivity you want to achieve. Uh, you have to think about the what solvents you choose and what pH range you want to work in, as this is critical for the um, for the uh, downstream separation. Um, you have to consider your extraction methods and the parameters surrounding that extraction method. So really looking at that in an example, different sample matrices and analyte extraction strategies will lead to different levels of outcomes. So in the example I'm showing you on this slide is where on the picture on the left-hand side, if you follow the USP monograph, you get a sample uh, of the Nepazil, which is rather cloudy and would probably not fare too well in your LC instrumentation. This will cause trouble downstream. A very basic level of filtration clears up the um, analyte considerably, and you there then have to decide is this good enough for my analysis or do I need to purify and clean up further, as you see in the picture to the right? Really, bottom line, because sample extraction is such a complex field, you have to be very clear with how you write your sample preparation methods and your SOP methods. I cannot teach you on how to write a method, but I can only advise you to make sure that the SOP can be followed by a variation of analysts with different levels of experience. Okay, the sample is ready to go on the LC of choice. I want to briefly touch on how you can monitor that your LC and column are working to your expectation and meet your demand or the demand of the analytical target profile. This is then where system benchmarking starts to play a role. Now, what is benchmarking? The principle of benchmarking is to routinely use a quality control reference material or QCRM on your analytical instrument to evaluate key performance criteria in comparison with data that was generated when you know the system was in good working order. The current and historical data will then allow for identification of areas of excesses of <laughs> excess variation, sorry, which may warrant concern and action. The QCRM benchmark result will be specific to the performance of the system it is run on. All measurements have some level of variability. Please understand that. 
Trending of results over time is useful for defining variability on a single system, on multiple systems, or on systems in different locations. The benchmark result using the QCRM over time will provide an understanding of the capability of your system to provide reliable results and a useful troubleshooting tool. A QCRM, the standard, needs to be precise, accurate, reproducible, lot to lot and appropriate to the type of analysis you're doing. The quality of your reference material is critical in evaluating your system performance and the validity of your analytical data. Just to show an example of how QCRM and system monitoring can help you stay on track. The differences you see here on the slide are quite obvious. But in reality, those changes in peak shape and in separation will occur over time and may not be visible to the untrained eye, and if not monitored. You want to help the less experienced an, uh, analysts not to waste time on uh, troubleshooting non-performing systems if that have, could have been caught by simply performing system health monitoring on a continuous basis. Depending on your QCRM need and analysis method, we have a variety of QCRM standards available. Uh, we have a wide range of quality reference standards to act as independent standards for specific methods such as reverse phase, hillock, the motor separations, uh, meaning isocratic or gradient, and separation technique. QRS can also be used when a method fails besides assuring system and column performance. So, coming to an end, to sum this all up, looking at MLCM, in MLCM stage one, you developed a robust method. Um, you identified the sources of variability and you have established control of the risks involved. You have chosen the separation scale and uh, subsequently the best chemistry for that separation scale. You have chosen the most suitable fit for purpose sample vial and you established a uh, robust sample preparation method with very clear and well-written instructions. In MLCM stage two, you validated your method. Um, you established that your method operates as intended and you demonstrated the ability of consistently delivering the data you desire and you need. In stage three, you then continuously demonstrate the suitability of the method performance. Um, you can do that with track system and column performance health and continuous monitoring. And uh, this will help you to detect the areas of concern early. In the end of it all, you will have fewer out of spec and out of trend concerns. All of this will allow you, once this is in place, to modernize methods if any part of the process demands such an action. So the method lifecycle management is a living approach to methods development and method sustainability. When you partner with waters and their quality consumables, that will help you ensure that your method will work in the future as it does today. And this is true for columns, for vials, and for standards and reagents. On that note, I hope you enjoyed this uh, short seminar in the Insight, and I hope I could clarify some questions. Uh, many things have been said about method lifecycle management, and I hope I was able to build the bridge between the choice of quality consumables and how they can help you to uh, fulfill your MLCM strategy. Thank you very much for listening.